Tamer Sharif uh, to, to, to expose the treatment of the giant pituitary adenoma. Voilà. Thank Mr. you, Barry. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Barry. Um, thank you, all my friends. Nadia, uh, so many friends, all of us, uh, I think we are working towards uh, education and that's the way to go about it. I think the most important thing when you've lost out big time in um, uh, the time that's lost mainly for um, our friends uh, who uh, we want to train and all that, and we are unable to do that, so we need to improve this. So I'm just going to... screen share this can you all see this yes yes okay brilliant um so endoscopic surgery actually um i used to do all pituitaries microscopic until 2001 and then um, uh, i did some work with kappa bianca and uh, with our friend divitis in uh, uh, in italy and uh, really thought that i could do much better job uh, with even bigger tumors because the types of tumors that we see in Pakistan or in our part of the world where in some areas there could be giant tumors. Giant tumors are anything that's more than four centimeters um, in length or at the same time 20 uh, centimeter of uh, the cube that we have for the total surface area. So uh, and for us the important thing is how to deal with them safely and there are different types of tumors that we need to know that, you know, they're, how you take care of them is completely different to a simple microadenoma or a centimeter tumor that we operate on. So this is Pakistan. Pakistan got the, uh, out of the 10 tallest peak in the world, five are in Pakistan. So this is K2 base camp. This, all these people are standing here. That's the K2, that's the second tallest peak in the world. This is the tallest, uh, this is the highest lake in the world, Saful Muluk. And this is the same lake during a different time in the plains of Swap. It's famous. Northern area is amazing. It's so there are three uh, Kurakaram Himalayan uh, range that meet. And because of that, um, that area is amazing and most beautiful. Uh, so what are the types of tumors when we see, we are talking about giant tumors. So these are the kind of tumors that we see. And these tumors actually are, um, um, they would present with many different ways than compared to any other tumor that we see. So vision is one thing, but that's besides the point. The other thing is that they would uh, present with mass effect and also would present with obstruction of the ventricular system causing hydrocephalus. So, you know, you, you, can, you can do this, image, you can do this without image guidance. But nowadays what's happened is for last... Um, 14 years, we have done all of these image guided and all of these endoscopic. Uh, the last time I have done a transcranial approach for a pituitary is actually seven or eight years ago. Um, so generally speaking, majority of the time we are able to uh, get everything from below, even in giant tumors. Procedure, I think this is this talk. Actually, I asked for her, what, how should I keep the talk? And I was told there'll be half and half, uh, uh, half trainees and half consultants. So consultants know everything. So I wanted to keep it basic. Uh, for me, when I'm doing a pituitary surgery, my thing is patient has to be under general anesthesia, orotracheal intubation, patient supine. I keep just a trunk elevated 10 degrees and I turn the head 10 degrees towards the surgeon. But you can do it whichever way suits you. Um, and there are different ways of adjusting that as well. You need to be friends with your anesthetist. You can't have an anesthetist who doesn't get along with you. Otherwise, he can make this life, your life really hard in theater because you need to have hypotension slightly. And it's a controlled hypotension and excellent analgesia. You want to keep the mucosal bleeding to the minimum. Position really depends on where the tumor is, but with over time, even whatever position you keep, you can deal with it. But when you start out, it's important. If you have got a lesion in the sphenoid or the clivus, the head is slightly flexed. Whereas you extend it, if it's a, you want to go up and the plenum, and then head is left in the a neutral position or slightly hyperextended. And this is because you, know, you don't want a big chest coming in your way when you're doing this. Throat pack is important. You need to be, it should be carefully done, done by a senior person, not by the junior most anesthetist, because if they do it wrong, the blood can trickle into the stomach and you can have post-operative vomiting. And that could erase the IC, uh, ICP. You could have a CSF leak following that. 
And in the end, they should suck the nasopharynx, oropharynx, and if any blood has gone underneath in the stomach as well. Um, acromegalic patients, you should not be starting out with acromegalic. They are not easy to do to start with. Uh, uh, kissing carotid arteries are known in acromegalic, but we, you know, we have only seen six of those um, um, kissing carotid arteries in the last 20 years. Bone is much thicker. There's no doubt blood vessels are larger. Carotids are more tortuous, so you can have more bleeding. Uh, and if you want to take all of that out, so anytime you're drilling, you have to be very careful because the vessels are very fragile. Anesthesia is an important uh, point because, because of the jaw problems, anesthesia could be difficult along with intubation. What we have learned over time, if you have got a giant tumor, you need to know, can you take out safely, safely? Would it be hard or would it be soft? And the way to do it is we do a T2-weighted MRI. And on the T2-weighted MRI, if uh, there is a hypo-intensity, then you think about that this may be hard consistency. So you need to be careful with that. And you know there are various things you need to look at in these uh, MRI when you start with. So you need to look at, for example, this lesion is occupying whole of the sphenoid. It's encasing both the carotids on both sides. Uh, how much of extension there is? Is it going into the anterior ethmoid, the posterior ethmoid, or uh, which part of the sphenoid? Is it, is it how much of the sphenoid is pushed out? What kind of sphenoid it is? What kind of suprasellar or cavernous extension it's caused? So you need to know all this. So for example, a tumor like this, this tumor is actually lying um, in whole of the sphenoid and then a bit of it is going up. So although it is a giant tumor, a four centimeter tumor, but this is much more easy to do because half of it is already below the planum. So this, if you come in from here, this is already, you can easily take it out. The important thing to remember is sometimes you can have a vessel here in this um, buttress, um, buttressing of the tumor itself. So this waste coats uh, need to be uh, identified beforehand and you don't want to be putting in your curette here and pulling this out and causing a problem or a bleeding intracranially. So all this you need to study beforehand, how much of its extension is into the plenum, how much is it going up. And so you need to have a plan beforehand before you do this. So if, for example, this um, tumor is already lying half of it into the uh, sphenoid itself. So again, the life is much more easier for us. So these tumors are easy to do because it's only going a centimeter and a half above the plenum. So these are not difficult to do and they will, can be done easily in a single stage. Uh, the important thing is to realize that how much of carotid is in case, how much of cavernous in, is involved and what is the extension going up. So Hardy's and NOS classification is done in every patient in order to see pre and post what we've achieved and what was our objective before and after. Uh, I always use a bilateral endonasal approach no matter what I'm doing and the reason for that is if you continue to do that, then you'll get better and better. Uh, with these adenomas, we always do a flaps because you know they're quite big sometimes and you can have a leak and that then these flaps are uh, uh, an ideal for us. So any patient with large macroadenoma, supraparacellar. So it's important that you've got a angulation that's through which all this is coming in. And uh, then it is going onto the contralateral side, supracellar, uh, paracellar. And so if your uh, instrument is coming from the right side, you can do left more. If they're coming from the left side, you can do right more so because the, uh, there is a cross edge of um, all these uh, instruments in this area. You can have a narrow nasal cavity or an anatomical variance, uh, making the progression to the cella difficult. So that's why it's easier to use a simultaneous uh, second nostril as well. And it's, it's much, much, much easier. So if you use soft tissue shavers and, and through biting instruments uh, to remove the mucosal septa, then you get less bleeding, you get better vision. We use bag biters routinely. Uh, we prevent the septum from brushing against the end of the endoscope and causing bleeding and vision problem. So this is actually a joke that me and Amin Kassam shared about how to do this. And basically what he is doing is he's tying my hands and showing me that if you want to operate, you want to have your hands free. And for that hands free, we need to have this one half rule. One half rules is that, you know, whatever amount of exposure that you have on the top, you at least need to have half of that exposure below as well. So this much should, of the clivus should be seen, the clival, um, uh, the carotid lying below on both sides should be seen as well. And this is for your instruments to come in. Otherwise, if you don't do that, your instruments, you won't be able to bring in, although you can have a very good view, but you won't be able to take it out. 
Hadad flap is simple and obviously it's phenopelotine artery, you know, and it's basic, basically what we are doing is that this is nasal septal artery coming in here and you have got the ostium here, you have the coana here and you lift the flap simply very easily. And if you, if you do that in every patient, then it makes, it makes life much easier. I don't use an ENT because they take a lot of time. It's much more easier for me to operate and do this quickly. They could take up to two hours doing this. And for us, it takes about 20 minutes. So I feel it's much safer for us to do this. Uh, so vascularized flap with the nasal septal artery is very important. Uh, and I use it um, in nearly all uh, big tumors or any uh, meningiomas that, are doing in this, uh, that I'm operating in this area. Many a times I would sometimes use a middle turbinate um, uh, uh, flap as well. And we have done that as well in some cases. But you know th this works very well for us, Hadad flap. So I'll just show you briefly how it works. So I'm just going to take this forward. So you just um, scrape along the septum, take it down, and you know your incisions on both sides. And the flap is rotated, and you bring it down. And it, this is the bottom of the flap. And at the same time, then we bring out the, bring out the reverse flap as well. So I'm just going to take it forward. And so we bring the reverse flap and we put all of that down in the coana so that once we are finished, we can always bring it in and um, uh, do that at the end of surgery. So sphenoid septum, preoperative, you need to look at what kind of sphenoid it is. There are different types of sphenoid and you need to know that. Actually, there is a ACNS, Asian Congress of Neurological Surgeons book on this. And I wrote two chapters on this, on the complications and the uh, tips and tricks and then you can see what kind of flaps you can do and what kind of sphenoid there is and what problems it can have and what is the best way of going about it. Dural incision is typical, just like you do in a microscopic procedure. I always use a Doppler or puncture with a 25 gauge needle, confirming there is no vascular structure underneath. And it makes life much more easier for us for to be sure that you know, we're not causing any problems. The cellar dura has got two layers and there's the section between them may cause uh, bleeding. So it's important that when you are operating on microadenomas, in Cushing's, in acromegalic, that you cut this in one layer. If you cut it uh, separately, then you're going to have bleeding in between. So tumor removal principle are same as uh, just like you're going to do microscopic approach, cruciate uh, dural incision. So I sometimes use that, sometimes use crisscross. So when I'm doing a, um, these large giant tumors, I use crisscross to use maximum exposure. And by crisscross, the big biggest advantage is that you can go all the way on the top on both sides and you can use those flaps. And sometimes I use a stitch as well to lift the flap up to go underneath to remove these. Right angle dissectors to define the subdural planes and remove inferior and lateral aspect first. And we know why, because if you, if you remove them first, uh, then obviously you allow the supracellular tumor to descend with time. Um, so lateral portion is removed gently with blend curettes because you want to be causing damage to the carotid or the cranial nerves, which sometimes you can see when you're too aggressive or using um, not a very soft um, curette. Well, salva or maybe an injection of 10 mils of um, uh, saline via lumbar drain can also push it down. Some people use bilateral jugular compression. I felt that I did not require any of these during these surgeries. So warning for us is the initial removal of the central and superior part of macroadenoma. If you go and remove central and the superior first, then you cause problems and the lamina terminalis comes down and you can cause problems and then you won't be able to take out the tumor completely. In further resection, difficult and the chance of CSF leak goes up. So inspection is at the end we do with 30 degrees or 45 degrees, which are advanced sequentially into the tumor cavity. And we ver verify the presence of any tumor remnant imprisoned in the recesses. So there are small recesses. If you're really stuck, then what I use, a, use a patty and with a uh, curette and a suction, I put a patty on top and then you can remove it from the sides. So cellular repair. For these tumors, it's generally not a big problem. As long as you have a flap, it works very well. You should not um, overpack the cella. Uh, there's a, if there's a big dead space, there is a thing called spongospore. Spongospore is just like spongistan, except for it gets absorbed over the next um, two weeks or so slowly. So if you are worried that the whole optics are going to come down and cause problems, so you put in spongospore 
and, and a spore. And it basically slowly and gradually get absorbed. So any of these tumors when I use, I always do that. And that helps so to slowly bring the tumor down, uh, the laminar terminalis down instead of doing it in a hurry. Hemostasis, uh, you know, it, if you have bleeding, it prolongs operative time. It can cause problems. And, and you know, it's uh, difficult to identify the normal pituitary gland. You can injure the artery um, as well, supplying the pituitary and operation can be prematurely aborted. So what we do is we use warm water irrigation, we use um, ice cold cautery, we put our, the uh, ice cold water and we put our bipolar in that. We use bone wax with patties, we use xylocaine with adrenaline patties, we use gel foam and a um, mixture of all these cotinoid in patients. And in some patients where it really it's a problem, then you can use flow seal. Um, to if you have it available to make sure that you can get on with your job quickly and with, um, with time. This is uh, uh, just a study in which large and giant tumors were removed and uh, they had 73 patients uh, uh, during the seven year period. Then mean tumor diameter was four centimeters, volume was 18 centimeter. And they showed that you know, on their six patients went for radiotherapy Rest of them, they were able to remove with minimal uh, problems. Uh, majority of the time, they had good tumor excision. So if you look at another study, and these guys um, were able to resect about 82% uh, of the times, the gross total resection in about one-fourth of the patients, and 73% improved visual equity, and 37% of the time, um, there were 32 complications. So this was our initial uh, experience with giant tumors and slowly and gradually that improved and now it's completely different. This is uh, again in north of Pakistan, a place called, um, uh, the, the, the whole issue is that this area is Gilgit and in this area you have all, all these mountains all around which is about 5,000 meters high and it's amazing and there's a lake in the center of it, uh, amazing place and you guys should visit that place sometime. So uh, functioning tumors, uh, of these tumors, 16 of them were uh, functioning tumors. Of that, only one was prolectinoma. And the reason we had to do that was because it was a giant tumor and we gave uh, bromocryptine and started to leak CSF because it opened up a hole in the head and we had to go in. 10 were echinomegalix, uh, five were um, ACTH tumors and 74 were non-functioning of the 90 giant tumors that we operated in last 15 years. So this is a patient who, with whose consent we have put these pictures. So a giant tumor with the uh, tumor extension of grade four going on the side. Despite that, we were able to take it down because there were clear smooth margins and was soft and easy to take down. This is a post-op scan after six years, actually. This is a patient with the um, ACTH secreting, which uh, presented the bleed is about 20 centimeters and in a post-op no problems and has done very well and has been followed up did not require any further um, uh, medical treatment or radiotherapy after that the last patient that i've sent for radiotherapy was actually last week otherwise in last um, um, all these years we have if we have left a residual tumor behind we have gone back and taken it out or followed them so you know again this tumor is easy to do because half of it is already in the sphenoid so there's not much extension there and it's easy to remove from that aspect. So you need to look at these very carefully. You can see the gland lying on the top. And so if you know beforehand where, where the gland is, then our problems could be minimum. So all these tumors can be removed with, uh, with quite simple uh, surgery. So we showed in our patients that if the tumor height was more, the resection uh, rate, rate was less. So it, in, in just like we expected, because many a times the tumor is stuck on the top and it doesn't come down with time. And uh, uh, if it doesn't come down, despite using whatever maneuvers, we wait. And after um, six months or so, if you repeat the scan, the whole tumor comes down. If patient still has visual problems, I would repeat a scan in a month's time and go back in again and do it on a second stage. And so you've got tumors like these, again, another giant tumor and the extension on both sides beyond the carotid going up into the third. But these tumors are easy to do compared to tumors in which it's starting out higher up at the planum instead of from below. So if you look at the grading, um, then you know it's non-invasive to the cavernous sinus, extension beyond the internal uh, intercarotid line, 
And this is NOS grading that's been used for last 15 years. And we always use this and have shown that obviously the higher the grade uh, NOS, the complete uh, excision is not that much. And we know that if you're leaving uh, some lateral um, to the carotid or in the cavernous sinus, it's not a big problem for us to do a follow-up scan and keep an eye on it on these. These patients, patients we have found only 2% of these increase in size afterwards. So majority of them, we keep a, a close follow-up and do routine scans on these. Endocrine out outcome, if you look at this, uh, functioning tumors, so of the 16, 13 were cured, and majority of them, as you say, see acromegalic and ACAT had secreting tumors. So again, another cortisol secreting tumor um, that was removed. Uh, preservation of fun function of uh, pituitary is important, and so it's important that every time we, uh, we do this, we make sure we know exactly where the gland is. If you can't find it, we go and sit with the radiologist and see if he can, they can show us where exactly it is. And if you know beforehand, and then with endoscope, then you can identify the gland, you can identify the stalk, and make sure that you keep it intact. So preservation of tumor um, uh, endoscopic versus microscope. There are many studies that have shown that there's a huge difference um, in preservation of pituitary um, function in these patients. And there are not one, but many studies that, are, that have shown that again and again, especially in giant tumors, it's much, much more safer because the tumor is lying way forward. So it's important that you, you use endoscope to go all the way and uh, remove this. Just, just going to show you a case. Uh, so basically this is the approach and you can see that you've got septum in the middle. So just taking the, uh, opening the uh, bony edges, going all the way on both sides. At that time, you're using this needle instead of a Doppler. So go in, open it up, um, all four corners and aggressively take it out. And the important thing to remember is majority of them, if you have dissection beforehand, uh, with a um, blunt curret and go all around. You can remove it all the way. As you can see, you've, you've gone all the way and you can see that this part of uh, uh, just there, we are able to see arachnoid. And so we leave the arachnoid intact and take all of it out in these giant tumors. So in this particular case, uh, we did not use a flap because there was no leak. Um, this is a study that we did uh, with our friends in Germany in which we, uh, them and us together, we looked at all our tumors that we operated. And of those 70 patients, um, we could um, do a complete excision, a radical excision in 88% of them. And we always wanted to identify the gland. And once we identified the gland, it was easier for us, for us to be more aggressive with the tumor and take it out in majority of the cases in 88% of these cases. And at the same time, we could preserve the hormonal function as well because of this improved uh, vision that we have with the endoscope. With diabetes insipidus, intraoperative CSF leak may predict permanent diabetes insipidus. So you need to avoid that. For that, you need to be very careful with your scope all the way forward. The pituitary stalk is lying on the distended diaphragma all the way down. So it's important that when you're removing it, you keep a close eye on that. And every time you're operating, use blunt instruments. The only time I use pituitary is when I can clearly dissect and see that I've got a separate piece of a thick tumor lying together. Otherwise, majority of the time, is, majority of the time we use blunt instruments. Uh, also, uh, when we are using two hand instruments and removing these, what we do is um, uh, we're able to dissect it all the way. So you, you hold it one, with one hand with pituitary, the other one with a suction and slowly take it down and you're able to remove it just like you're doing a microscopic surgery. So it's careful surgical manipulation of diaphragm at the junction of stalk with the laminated pituitary gland is the most important step to avoid diabetes and CBS. Um, if the location and extent of the normal gland could be accurately determined preoperatively, the gland, its function may be effectively preserved. And that's what we've shown. So it's important to see where exactly the stalk is, the gland itself, and the vessel supplying it. Despite that, you know, you're able to get it out uh, completely if you have, uh, if you know beforehand where exactly the gland is. For CSF leak prevention, what we have found is in our first uh, five years of uh, endoscopic surgery, we did have 7% um, of CSF leak. Now we have brought it down to 1.5%. And the whole reason behind that is one is experience, obviously, and we have got better uh, endoscopes as well. But at the same time, the technique and the maneuvers that we do 
uh, near the diaphragm. So previously used to use aggressive suctioning on the diaphragm. Don't do that because you can leaf in holes there. So we scrape it gently or with two hand technique and taking it down. It's important that you're able to bring all of this down. The important thing to understand the problem that we have with these giant tumors, if there is a buttress effect or you've got a waistcoat in between that everything should be done safely and do not pull them down uh, from those waistcoat because you can cause bleeding and serious problems. And so hematomas are a problem with these tu giant tumors because you leave a big vacuum space in contact with optic apparatus. And they can cause even worsening of the vision. So if you have no leak, negative l selva maneuver, an absence of prolapse of chiasma towards the cellar, the supracellar remnant, the absence of filling of the cell and absence of reconstruction can permit reduction of uh, risk of post-operative compressive hematoma. So here I use sponge, uh, spongospore in majority of these cases. And as Kappa Benka said, 70% of these do not require uh, uh, closure and packing of the cell. And you don't pack it too much. Overpacking can cause vision problems as well. So you need to be very careful at this. Everybody has had a carotid artery injury. I've had one, but the important thing is you need to be prepared for it. What works best with carotid artery is muscle. So if you have a, the only thing that's been shown that it would work very, very well is muscle. So if you've got a piece of muscle ready and you uh, just um, uh, wrap it around a um, piece of surgery cell, you can, if you put it on top of wherever the bleeding spot is, find out where the bleeding spot is, put it on top and use um, uh, a flow seal on top, um, it works very well. I'm to follow that. The best thing to uh, do is to avoid a carotid artery injury. If it happens with fibrous heart tumors when they're, you're operating on recurrent tumors. And the, generally, when it, it happens, it's generally when you're doing the intracellular resection. And it's with large tumors, neuronavigation and doctors, uh, if you don't use it, then you can cause problems to yourself. I always use neuronavigation. I always use Doppler's probes to avoid this. And you would need either stent or occlusion to follow this. Post-operative complications, it's important, as I was talking about, that if you have something like that, you have to be careful. So this was a doctor with seven siblings who were doctors as well that I was operating on. And while I was, this was about you know, seven, eight years ago, and I, had, uh, I was trying to pull this bit of tumor from the top and this vessel evolved. And uh, because of that, had this subarachnoid hemorrhage and patient had to stay in ICU for um, a month, eventually made out of it, but with a lot of problems and still has some functional disability. So the important thing to remember with these giant tumors is that your experience is the most important thing. You need to read, teach, share knowledge, whatever dissections are important, endoscopic skills are important, all these endoscopic uh, workshops that we do. Every patient, you have to plan uh, the surgery beforehand. You need to have adequate endoscopes. You can't do this with um, a low definition endoscopes. You have to have adequate instruments, some long ones because of the, the length of the giant tumors that you're operating on. And uh, you need to make sure that you're able to do this biomanual technique. You need to have a regular follow-up on these patients. You need to work with your team. You need to travel, teach, and learn. So there are so many workshops that nowadays are happening. Nowadays, uh, uh, for last three months, because of COVID, we are unable to do that. But generally, otherwise, uh, you can travel to so many interesting people all over, all over the world who can teach, um, and you can learn from them at the same time, see them operate, learn life surgery. And I think all that is important for us. Or if you can get somebody to your can come and help, might be the best that you do. surgery, majority of the patients um, get well. Some of these patients may come in comatose and may require um, a shunt, a divergent procedure beforehand. Um, and these, those patients, you really have to wait until everything settles down and then you operate on them and not, don't hurry things. Total ex uh, excision correlates with the height and the texture of the tumor. So NOS grading and Hardy's grading is important here. Visual symptoms improved in 97% of our cases. And you know, uh, we were able to look, uh, visualize the lateral tumor much better with 30 degree and 40 degree scopes. And um, you, it's important to thoroughly understand uh, pituitary endocrinology 
select patients for surgery, manage pre and post operative care, and make appropriate decisions for uh, during these surgeries. So I'm going to conclude here. Thank you very much. It was brilliant having um, coming to this uh, webinar. The other thing important to understand is the vision of the surgical tar tar target with endoscope of, uh, can really go have be more effective in removal of the tumor, better clinical results, and reduction in complications, along with uh, improvement in vision compared to microscope because you're right there at the site. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Salman. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Salman, for this uh, wonderful uh, lecture. Uh, what happened? Sorry. I don't know if we can uh, uh, read the question now for the <laughs> Professor Salman, or we continue with uh, with other lecture. I, if you can, if you can have I questions think, now, it would be just better. Just let me finish my my my, my <laughs> just my comment, and then I think we will uh, continue all the talk, the talks, and we will leave all the questions at the end. Bahri, mm. are you agree with the, my proposition to yeah. leave all the questions at the I, end? And I just agree, Madame. Finish my my congratulations to Professor Salman Sharif for this uh, nice talk and uh, to have this overview of the uh, this endoscopic approaches and how to, how to avoid the all the complication and uh, 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 so thank you Salman for this uh, very uh, grateful for this uh, 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 your participation on this webinar. I think uh, Professor Kamal Bahri or uh, Professor Kamun, can you please yeah, okay. uh, introduce the next person? Madam Abedi, uh, and yes. now uh, I think think uh, the the discussion uh, will be after uh, the last uh, the yeah. last uh, yeah. intervention. So uh, I invite uh, Mr. Mahmoud Masrer, Professor Mahmoud Masrer, to deal about uh, transcranial versus endoscopy approach for giant and large epithelial adenoma. Mr. Mahmoud Masrer. Can you see? Yes, yes. We have your. Uh... We have my de my yeah. my desktop. Yes, we have. We see your desktop. So uh, just uh, you can go to the presentation, please. Thank you, Mahmoud, again for accepting our invitation, Thank and we are very, very, very uh, happy to have you uh, today with us. Uh, professor Mahmoud Masrer, he is a professor in. Uh, I, I am just uh, uh, repeating that because uh, we are uh, some uh, participants to join us uh, lately. So, Professor Mahmoud uh, Masrer, he is a professor of neurosurgery in the uh, Sachu of Lausanne in Switzerland. And he's originally from uh, Algeria, and we are proud to have our colleague in uh, this uh, uh, really very well-known uh, team in uh, Switzerland. Thank you, uh, Mahmoud, to accepting our invitation. Thank you very much, uh, Nadia. Thank you very much, uh, Kamel, for your invitation. Good morning to everybody. I'm very glad to be here and to talk about the indications of the transcranial approach for pituitary uh, adenoma. Uh, classically, we have two main options to address these tumors. The first one is transcranial approach, while the second one is represented by the transcranial approach. When you talk about transcranial approach, you can include classical uh, approach as well as extended approach by the endoscope. With the transcranial approach, we include different approaches, subfrontal approach, frontolateral or pterional with or without uh, FTOZ. About more than uh, 94 
percent of these tumors can be approached through transfinoidal approach. Why in less than 5% of cases, a transcranial approach is necessary? And I will talk about uh, this uh, transcranial approach. This is a timeline showing the evolution of the surgical techniques during the last century. We can see how the beginning of the last century, transcranial approach was the preferred one, the red line, until the 17th when the transfinoidal approach started to spread and then it became popular with the spreading of the microscope in the 1970s uh, and then with the introduction of uh, the endoscope. Some of the classical indications of uh, transcranial approach were dumbbell-shaped tumor, inaccessible supracellular extension, the presence of large paracellular extension, or fibrous uh, consistency. The, that is evident through the analysis of the signal on preoperative MRI, where the tumors appear like a hypo or iso signal on T2 weighted images. However, I think nowadays indications that were previously considered as absolute indication for transcranial approach, all this kind of uh, tumor now we can approach with the transfinoidal approach with the, the on the scope. So, which approach nowadays and for which? Uh, tumor. Let's start with the giant adenoma. They are tumors that are bigger than four centimeter. They represent less than 10% of all pituitary uh, adenoma today, and more than 60% are non-functional pituitary adenoma. How to deal with them? Uh, we have different options. We can use transfinoidal approach, transcranial approach. We can use both techniques uh, simultaneous or in two stages. Uh, I will I would say that today the transfinoidal approach is the first choice. Now uh, everybody uh, agree with me. Uh, we have to start with the transfinoidal approach thanks to the improved technology extended approach. This assumption is supported by a large literature body. I want to show you here a, a transfinoidal approach by endoscopic for this huge macroadenoma. It's important to open widely the uh, cellular floor to expose both carotid artery. We can see here the both carotid artery. We can work between the both carotid artery. We can go also in the retro carotid space. We work uh, with uh, two hands uh, here. And finally, we can introduce the ontoscope inside the, the, the cella to see if there is a residue or no. And this is the post-operative MRI. And we can achieve a gross total resection for this uh, giant uh, macroadenoma. Uh, in giant, micro, uh, uh, in giant pituitary adenoma, we can consider different types. We, can, we cannot put all this uh, giant uh, in the same box. We can have tumors with a large diaphragma cellar, like uh, in this configuration, with uh, a hyper signal in T2. So we are expected a soft uh, tumor. This is a good indication for transfinoidal approach, and we can do a gross total resection. We can see here the post-operative MRI with the pituitary, normal pituitary gland, the pituitary stalk, and we can do gross total uh, resection. Uh, a second configuration uh, can be when the diaphragma cellae is a small and the tumor has a dumbbell shape, like uh, in this uh, configuration. So in this case, the resection is generally more difficult, but when we have a hyper signal in t weighted image, we, uh, we suspect the consistency is soft and we can do, uh, we can start with the transfinoidal approach and we can achieve gross total resection with this uh, kind of tumor 
thanks to the uh, hyper signal into the, uh, in T2 and the soft uh, uh, consistency of the tumor. There are sometimes other configurations that can require more reflection, like extension lateral to the supraclinoid enterocarotid artery, or when there is a large subfrontal extensions, or also when there is an arterial enhancement, it's very important to, uh, to see the, uh, this situation before the surgery, or when at the T2 MRI, there are some flare changes, like uh, here, it means uh, there is a uh, brain invasion, or when the tumor has a low or easy intense signal on T2, it can be a sign of fibrous consistency or hard consistency. This is an example of a giant pituitary adenoma managed by combined technique. First of all, we started with the transcranial approach with FTOZ craniotomy. We removed all this uh, part of this uh, lesion, supracellular and in, uh, inside the temporal fossa. We can see here the anterior uh, cerebral artery. After that, we do a second uh, approach with the transgenoidal approach by endoscopic approach. And finally, we treat the residue in the right cavernous sinus by uh, GK. This is here, this is the uh, MRI at the three years after uh, follow up. So, giant adenoma transcranial approach was indicated only in irregular multinodular shaped tumor or eccentric extension into the temporal fossa or when there is an arterial enhancement. It's very important to start when you have a giant adenoma to start by transgenoidal surgery if you can do it and to reserve a transcranial approach in the specific situation. Another uh, uh, indication is uh, when you have uh, uh, an apoplexy for residual tumor after transphenoidal uh, surgery. Uh, this is an example of a 12 years old young boy that presented with a visual disturbance and he was instantly operated through transphenoidal uh, approach. The pathology revealed a GH adenoma. As you can see uh, in the pre-operative T2 MRI, the signal here Small. Hello. You can see my, yeah, uh, a small uh, portion of the tumor during a transgenital approach, and uh, this is the post-operative MRI. Excuse me. We can't see your slides. Can you share? You can hear me. We can hear you, but we can't see your slides. Ah. Can you share them again, please? Mahmoud, you can uh, unshare. After that, you share again. Okay. No, it's okay. Okay, you can see now? Yes, it's, it's, yeah, it's all right. Yeah, this is the post-operative MRI after transphenoidal surgery. The tumor was very hard. The immediate post-operative MRI, the patient decrease of left visual acuity. And uh, we, uh, we decide to take uh, the patient by transcranial approach. We perform a uh, uh, left uh, uh, peroneal approach and we can uh, do a gross total resection. The patient uh, improve his visual uh, acuity. Uh, another, uh, another indication 
if you have uh, after a first uh, the first surgery already performed by transfusional uh, approach a residue especially uh, functioning pituitary adenoma and if the radio surgery is not possible in this condition you have to consider a transcranial approach uh, to remove uh, this residue especially uh, when you have a functioning pituitary adenoma i want to show you an example here, uh, this patient operated by sinusoidal approach, by endoscopic approach uh, for GH adenoma. We can see here the adenoma uh, uh, inside the cella, but uh, there is an invasion of the cavernous sinus. We take out uh, all the tumor inside the, the cella, inside also the cavernous sinus, but we can see here. And so, Mahmoud, can you share again your uh, screen, please? Okay. We can't see your screen. <laughs> yeah. And you, you can see here the anterior clinoid process is uh, eroded. This is the residue. And we decided to approach uh, this uh, residue by transcranial approach through the Dolange triangle between the internal carotid artery and the third nerve. This is a small uh, video. The approach is a standard. This is the Minego orbital band. We can the Minego orbital band. This is the anterior clinoid process. We drill the anterior clinoid process. We identify the optic nerve medially, the internal carotid artery. This is the tip. This is the tip of the clinoid anterior clinoid process. And we can see here the tumor, the tumor is just here. This is the third nerve. And we approach the tumor inside through the Durlange triangle. Another indication is when you have ectopic pituitary adenoma, uh, two thirds of them are a situation secreting uh, adenoma. And uh, when you have this uh, ectopic pituitary, especially in, uh, uh, in near to the pituitary stalk or inside the third vertical, transcranial approach uh, is preferred. Other rare, very rare uh, indication of transcranial approach when you have a kissing carotid, especially in the GH adenoma, we can start with, uh, by transfinoidal approach. If uh, the tumor is a small, or if you have a micro adenoma, you can achieve gross total resection and uh, remission. And if you are uh, in front of a giant uh, adenoma, I think uh, you, you have to combine transcranial with the transphenoidal approach. Another rare uh, situation when you have coexisting uh, aneurysm, especially an aneurysm of the ACA or the anterior comedian artery, you can manage the both uh, the aneurysm and the pituitary adenoma by unique surgery by the transcranial approach. Uh, for conclusion, for giant adenoma, uh, the best indication for transcranial approach when you have a giant multilobulated adenoma, especially lateral to the internal carotid artery in the temporal fossa. When you have also apoplexy of residual tumor after transphenoidal uh, surgery, I prefer to go by transcranial approach uh, and to remove and to uh, decompress the optic nerve, especially when you have a severe uh, deficit of uh, visual uh, acuity. The third indication when you have a residue, especially for functioning pituitary adenoma, and we cannot uh, uh, do the GK, 
uh, we can uh, we can go for transcranial approach uh, for ectopic pituitary adenoma in the third ventricle or near the pituitary stalk or in uh, uh, very rare condition like a kissing carotid or existing aneurysm. Thank you very much. Professor, Hello? Cam Professor Camon, can you please uh, moderate the session or uh, Dr. Kamel? Yes. Yes. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Misrer, uh, for this uh, wonderful uh, lecture. Uh, and uh, now we, uh, I invite uh, uh, Professor uh, uh, Melhawi to uh, speak about uh, radio surgery in uh, macroadenoma, giant macroadenoma. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, dear colleagues, uh, Professor Abadi, for this uh, nice invitation to join uh, such uh, outstanding uh, lecture. Adil, sorry, just for introduce you, uh, Professor Adil Melhawi, because we have uh, with us many uh, participants from uh, uh, around the world. Professor Adil Melhawi, he is the professor of neurosurgery, and he dedicated his uh, career to the radio surgery. Of course, he's, uh, he uh, he is a tackle of uh, many uh, pathologies, but his uh, main uh, uh, main fields in radio surgery, and uh, we are happy to have you. Uh, with us today. Thank you, Adit, for accepting our invitation. Thank you. So I am joining the, the panel to talk about what may be the role of radio surgery uh, and speaking here of uh, gamma knife radio surgery in the treatment of large and giant pituitary adenoma. Uh, as you all know, uh, we all uh, neurosurgeons, in the last decades, radio surgery has become uh, widely used. Uh, and uh, for pituitary adenoma, uh, it was exactly the same situation. If you look at the statistics from uh, ELECTA, uh, more than uh, 82,000 cases treated uh, with these techniques for pituitary adenoma. So <laughs> we may ask the question about what is the role in large and giant uh, cases. Uh, if we look uh, in our series here in Rabat, uh, up to date, we have treated more than two, uh, 2,100, and uh, the pituitary adenoma are about uh, 7%, 137 uh, cases. So uh, uh, it represents a good part of our activity in benign tumors. Uh, there are some fundamentals about radiosurgery that we need to uh, keep in mind. Uh, the radio surgery, gamma knife radio surgery we use is used by neurosurgeon, and we have to make difference between other techniques of mainly radiation therapy. Can it be hypofractionated stereotactic radiotherapy, uh, hyperfractionated conformal radiotherapy, or of course conventional radiotherapy? We will uh, come back to, to this later. Uh, we have to keep in mind uh, that the radiobiology, meaning the the, uh, the clinical results from these techniques is based on different uh, fundamentals between radiosurgery and radiation therapy. So these fundamentals are important to get, keep in mind to understand any talk about radiosurgery. So what do we call large or giant uh, pituitary adenoma in radiosurgery? Uh, you know, there is a dogma in the literature. I, know, I think anyone that read about it uh, may find this three centimeter limit as uh, too big for radio surgery. So if you look three centimeter in radio surgery, we will always talk about volume, not only diameter or uh, uh, one length. So if you look about at the volume, we are speaking here about, about uh, 14 uh, cubic centimeters. Uh, if we look at our series of uh, uh, 137 cases of pituitary adenoma treated by radiosurgery in Rabat, so uh, more than 14 is about uh, 10 cases, so 7% of our cases. So this category still exists, and we are going to see how we can manage to, to treat these cases and what are the results. So why there is 
this uh, volume limit in radio surgery. As you all know, uh, gamma knife radio surgery is an effective, minimally invasive neurosurgical technique. So when we will try to apply this technique to larger volume, we will increase the risk of complications. So we may be no more minimally invasive. So we have to take care of this. And of course, if you want to avoid complication, then you will need to lower the, the radiation you give. So it means you will uh, maybe lose some efficacy. So the whole thing is about this balance. Am I able to treat this volume with good efficiency and safety for the patient? So what are the parameters? One of the main parameters to understand this volume uh, problem in radio surgery is what we call the penumbra zone. Penumbra zone is this red zone here within the normal brain that will still get radiation, although you are using the most precise technique, which means gamma knife. So this penumbra zone, if you have a small lesion, it will uh, be small, but when the lesion uh, increases, for example, for a 15 uh, cubic centimeter, the increase in the penumbra zone will be uh, quite big. So it means that when you are treating larger lesions, you are treating even larger amount of normal brain. And this means you can have problems. So this is why you have to pay attention to the volume. So as I said, the volume is not the only parameter. When you are treating a patient, you need to keep in mind that this is a complex situation for uh, decision making. You have to take in consideration the clinical situation, the topography, the histology, and of course, the dose volume uh, efficacy safety for the patient. So I think the origin of this dogma was coming mainly from the first generation of gamma knives who were working more in manual modes. But since perfection in 2006, we know that we have no limits for treating larger lesion, at least from the technical point of view. So regarding topography, if you are treating a lesion here in the frontal lobe, or if you are treating a lesion in the middle of the, the, the brainstem, of course, the risks are different. The risks are much higher when you treat within the brainstem. When we talk about pituitary lesions, these are extra axial lesions. So we are treating outside the brain. So the toxicity for the brain, of course, will be even lower. So this will allow us to, uh, I mean, make some uh, steps forward in the treatment of these uh, patients. So volume is not a limit, we know it. Uh, if we look at this very nice meta-analysis published by the International Stereotactic Radio Surgery Society, just coming into uh, 2020 this year, uh, you see that when the, all the authors report, we have small mean uh, volume of 3.5. But if you look at, at the higher volume here, it can go up to 38 0.7 cubic centimeter. This is at the international level. So we are almost three folds more than this upper limits of three centimeters, which would be around 14 cubic centimeter. So what are the strategies we have uh, in the radio surgery for treating uh, larger lesions? We can use, of course, the uh, radiotherapy philosophy of fractionation, which means we are trying to get lower toxicity and better uh, protection of the optic pathways by fractionation. This is uh, one solution, but we need to keep in mind that, that doing this we may lose the benefit of the single dose from the radiological point of view, because this is benign tumor. And we know that benign tumor will respond better to single dose. And here, of course, uh, the, the, the generation of gamma knife has evolved. We will see the icon now who allow us to do this fractionation. And there is another option, which is the volume staging. So the volume staging is instead of treating the whole lesion as a whole in one session, we may split it, for example, in two parts, as if we were doing uh, two steps uh, surgery. So we may treat one small part and then come back like three months later and treat the, the remaining. And this is a possible strategy for large benign tumor we, we may use. So there are solutions. I, were, I was speaking about the icon. So as you all know, now we have some, uh, uh, 
evolution of the machine. And with the icon now, we are able to do fractionation and uh, frameless uh, treatments. This is available here since uh, February 2017. Uh, so as I was saying, for large pituitary adenoma, volume may not be a limit since it is benign tumor. And we know that usually benign tumor, we need lower doses. So the, the tolerance is excellent. This is what we see, we see here in our experience and all uh, around the, the literature. Usually, as I said, these are extra action lesion. So the risk, risk for brain toxicity is really low. And also, as long as we are keeping the optic pathways uh, exposed to less than 12 grays, we know that the risk for uh, radiation-induced neuro neuropathy at the level of the optic pathways will be very, very low. The statistics here we have is less than 1%, and this is what we apply uh, here in Rabat, in many centers, as in Marseille, and uh, with this, we almost never see uh, radiation-induced uh, neuropathy at the level of the optic pathway, as long as we, we, we respect this uh, uh, technique of treatment. So, of course, we have limits, as uh, in any other case. And as I was saying, of course, any uh, signs of increased intracranial pressure, we know this is cases for surgery. When you have mass effects, mainly on the optic apparatus, on the brainstem, long tracks, the brain. All these cases, when you have huge tumor with symptomatic uh, mass effect, we know there is only one solution, which will be the, the surgical resection. Hydrocephalus, of course, uh, of course, hormonal status. Some patients, you need to treat them quite fast. So you cannot wait for the delay uh, action of radiosurgery. This is what you, you need to keep in mind. I mean, we can treat a huge lesion, compression, the, 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 the optic pathways without damaging the optic pathways with radiation. But if it is the, the mass effect before uh, response to radiosurgery that will damage the, the, the optic nerve, of course, the patient is not uh, uh, benefiting from this treatment. So we will not do it. So first, we need to have uh, the optic pathways free, and uh, we need uh, not to have any uh, mass effect from uh, what can be uh, called the huge or large uh, lesion before uh, uh, any kind of treatment. So what are the usual indications of radiosurgery? Usually we will really treat a small post-operative residue, uh, just as uh, the strategy uh, presented with uh, by Professor Mesrar, which means when you have a large uh, adenoma or giant adenoma, you will do your surgery, although uh, transfloidal or uh, craniotomy, reduce the mass. And if you have a small residue, this is a very good indication. This is the so-called combined strategy. And this is what we use on, in almost all the cases. So cavernous sinus is usually the most uh, frequent location for this uh, small residue. We don't have to do uh, very uh, uh, much invasive uh, surgeries as uh, we have seen. If there is a residue in the cavernous sinus, this could be uh, uh, nicely controlled with radio surgery with uh, no uh, harm for the, the patient. So as I said, there must be no optic pathway compression. If there is a, a problem of control of secretion, radio surgery can help. In cases of recurrence, we, we know we may have some cases. So of course, if the patient is well monitored, we may uh, detect the lesion still small. And this is a good indication for radio surgery. There are very limited cases of contraindication of uh, surgery. Uh, it can be uh, due to medical, uh, various medical conditions. And some cases, very limited, has been treated with good results. So we may, it may be considered in that case of situation also. So, and as I said, rare, really very rare and selected cases of well tolerated large lesions or large postoperative residue with almost no uh, mass effect after the surgery. These are the cases uh, we, we have treated and we will see uh, the result. So here's some example of the cases we usually treat. So this is 31 year old male with the uh, growth hormone secreting macroadenoma uh, with acromegaly. So he, he was uh, approached first by transfloid approach and then uh, we, we had uh, what was so-called recurrence either from the radiological point of view 
and the biological point of view. You have here the preoperative MRI, and you see here the one year after surgery, there is some small remnant at the level of the cella, but also uh, invading the cavernous sinus on the left. So this patient, as you can see, was treated. It was very small lesion, 3.4, 24 grays. And uh, you see here how we can nicely spare the optic pa uh, uh, pathways as long as you are far from there here uh, within almost two millimeters, you can drop from 24 grays to eight grays, which is really safe for the optic pathways. And here are the results, long-term results. You see very nice response from the volume uh, point of view, but also from the clinical and uh, the biological point of view, the patient responded very well. And uh, this is what is beautiful with the radiosurgery. As I explained, you can drop from 25 gray, which is the dose you use for functional um, uh, uh, pituitary adenoma to less than nine, eight grays, which is perfectly sparing the, the optic pathways here. And you can treat in a single session with this. Other results, you see very nice response. So this is for the small uh, lesions. About the large, when we need to, to, uh, to treat the large uh, lesion, uh, we know that uh, when we have non-secreting pituitary adenoma, the larger is the, the lesion, the lower will be the response rate. As I explained in the beginning, if we have extreme large lesions. If we want to treat them uh, safely, we will need to avoid uh, to lower the dose. And by lowering the dose, we, we will lose some efficacy. So our limits, if the reference dose is around 15 gray for a benign non-secreting, we can drop it as low as nine gray. We are still effective at around 70% response, but we will not treat uh, below nine gray and uh, so the, the volume can be a uh, limit, but still uh, some large cases has been treated uh, with success with these parameters. For secreting adenoma, the problem is even more complicated because uh, there you need higher dose. We are speaking about 24 to 30 grays. And of course, uh, you, you, you may lower, but if you want a, a response from the hormonal point of view, you will not be uh, below uh, 20, 20 grade. So here, uh, I think the limit will be around 15 to 20 uh, cubic centimeter, no more. So you are still large, but uh, you may need to be very, very careful. So as I said, also, we have another problem, which is the correlation between the volume and the secretion. So if you are trying to normalize your uh, secretion, you know that uh, the more the, the volume is big, the more you will have some problems. So this is clearly indication for uh, surgery to, to remove the, the mass. And uh, as we, we know, uh, the larger uh, the lesion, the lower would be the rate of uh, response. So anyway, when you have even large residue or small residue after uh, removing a, a, a large or giant adenoma, we know that radiosurgery is still better than radiation therapy. We, we think that one of the main uh, take home message is that we need to avoid radiation uh, therapy in young patients with benign lesions. You know, there is risk for oncogenesis at long term as high as 10%. There is higher risk for optic pathways, higher risk for deterioration of brain cognitive function, because with radiation therapy, you, they will irradiate large brain tissue, while uh, gamma knife is very selective and treating only the lesion. We have all the, uh, the side effects, uh, such as fatigue and so on, which are absolutely non-existing with the gamma knife. And uh, of course, if we consider uh, hormonal secretion or tumor control, uh, these rates are uh, much better with the, the gamma knife radiosurgery. So all these regions, uh, one message is really avoid radiation therapy in these patients. And if possible, uh, the, the radiosurgery, gamma knife radiosurgery is really best option. We can see here that the response to radiosurgery in all the series, you have here the rates if you consider only the, 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 the response rate from the growth point of view, all the series are above 90% because these are benign tumor, they respond very well to radiosurgery. 
uh, when we consider the hormonal secretion, here the problem is different because, as I said, you will need higher dose, and you see the pure rates can be very uh, 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 variable from one city to another. Here, we consider we have uh, less than 70% chance to, to cure. And as I said, it needs time. You need to wait uh, uh, almost five years before getting the maximum results from uh, the, the secretion and hormonal point of view. So some cases of large and uh, uh, pituitary we have treated. For example, here, this large residue after craniotomy, you see here, this is non-secreting. And uh, uh, since we cannot distinguish here the visual pathway, we have decided to treat this with fractions. So it was treated with three fractions separated by 24 hours, so three-day treatment, and at follow-up, absolutely no uh, visual deterioration because the patient was uh, still with vision and it was controlled uh, with no uh, visual deterioration. Another case here, you see the patient that was uh, operated. I have been involved with Professor Hamnishi in this case. So this is a young uh, patient, 26 years old, with the giant pituitary uh, growth hormone secreting adenoma, who was uh, operated, but uh, due uh, here also to the consistency, the resection uh, was limited. And uh, he had a very uh, complicated uh, post-operative uh, ICU uh, stay, but uh, uh, could make it. So we decided to, to do here a combination between medical treatment and radiosurgery. So you see here, here uh, this huge mass was treated with 18 gray, one single shot, and the control at eight years, you see almost a total disappearance of uh, the lesion with uh, clinical improvement, no visual deterioration, and patient is still under follow-up. So uh, this kind of cases uh, make uh, us say that it is possible in very selected cases to uh, include the radiosurgery in the treatment of these uh, quite complex cases. Of course, there are risks uh, one must know. So as I said, the radiation-induced visual deterioration is less than 1% as long as we respect the criteria for irradiation, which is less than 12 grade to the optic pathways. Other neuropathies, mainly in the cavernous sinus, are also very rare, less than 10% when you are treating at around 18 grade. But most of the patients will be treated uh, around 15, 12 grades. So we will be, uh, I would say, less than 1%. So complications are very rare. One complication, of course, is the new endocrinological deficit. This could be up to 30% at five uh, years, but mainly for functioning uh, uh, pituitary adenoma because we will use huge uh, dose, more than 20. Uh, the, the brain toxicity, uh, I said, is very rare. And of course, compared to uh, radiotherapy, there is almost no brain toxicity. So the tolerance is really good, no risk for induced mal malignancy. So tumor growth, uh, we have a, a failure about five to 10%. And of course, uh, the combination with microsurgery is uh, a must. So these techniques cannot be applied only in uh, multidisciplinary approach with, of course, uh, cooperation between uh, radio, uh, neurosurgery and radiosurgery team, which here in Rabat we have the chance it is uh, the, the same team. Uh, so in conclusion, in large and giant adenoma, surgical resection, of course, is the gold standard. So uh, lexel gamma knife radiosurgery now uh, must be considered as part of the armamentarium in a multimodal approach to deal with this large and giant pituitary adenoma, which can be quite uh, tricky and difficult. And thank you all for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Malhawi, for this excellent pre presentation. And uh, you hear me? Yes. yes. So uh, to finish our uh, four uh, intervention, I invite uh, Mr. Uh, my friend, Professor Sofian Bali, for, uh, from, from uh, National uh, National uh, Neurological Society, uh, Neurological uh, Department uh, from Tunis, Monji bin Ahmida, to deal or to talk 
about strategy for management of large and giant pituitary adenoma, the experience of Tunisia. Can you hear me? Professor Bahri. Yes. You hear me? Yeah. yeah. I hear you, Madam Abedi. Yes, yes, Sophia. No, no, no. Okay. Uh, you can begin, Sophia. Go, go yes. ahead. Share your okay. screen. Share your screen. Solid orange structure. It's okay. Uh, I would like first to thank you uh, for inviting me to participate in this uh, webinar uh, presented here uh, with uh, Professor Bahri, Professor uh, Neja Abedi, and uh, my friend uh, Brahim Tamoun uh, to present uh, the strategy for management of large. Hello? And uh, <clears throat> for, of large and giant pituitary adenoma. So, first, pituitary adenoma are the third most common intracranial neoplasm, accounting for 10% to 25% of intracranial neoplasm, with a prevalence of 16.9% uh, uh, of autopsy studies. Uh, subgroups subgroup of these uh, lesions are, uh, that are uh, particularly ch challenging to manage are those that can be classified as large or giant pituitary adenoma. G giant pituitary adenoma have classically been described as those uh, uh, with size superior to sorry, uh, four centimeter in maximum di uh, diameter. Uh, while large pituitary adenoma currently lack a consistent definition in existing literature. So, standard uh, nomencla uh, nomenclature used to describe pituitary adenoma is primarily based in size. Adenoma less than 10 millimeter are described as microadenoma. For adenoma uh, with size uh, more than 10 millimeter are macroadenoma. And for uh, those with the sizes more than 20 millimeter are large, are called large mac uh, macroadenoma. And adenoma uh, with size superior to 40 uh, millimeter are considered as giant uh, uh, um, macroadenoma. So, in 1979, Simon uh, all introduced the term of giant for pituitary adenoma larger than four centimeters in any direction. So once it's break through uh, the normal pituitary tissue, it may potentially infiltrate neighboring structure. It is important to dis distinguish tumor uh, extension from invasion. Invasion applies destructive infiltration of adjacent tissue, whereas extension implies directionally tumor growth with compression of uh, neighboring tissue or invasive adenoma exhibit uh, both qualities. So we have uh, classified uh, this uh, extension or inv uh, invasion of uh, this tumor to neighboring tissue by this classification called jules hardy classification. So as you know, the grade one, it is, uh, it, co uh, it compares all of tumor inside of the cella with the size less than one centimeter. And the grade two, it is macroadenoma with the size is more than the 10 millimeter within the cell. For grade three here, we have uh, a macroadenoma superior to uh, 10 millimeter with focal cellar erosion uh, outside the cell. And the, for the grade four, it is called infiltrate sphenoid and cavernous sinuses, compressed optic nerve, cranial nerve, and or invade adjacent brain. So uh, the grade three was classified or divided into two uh, classes by uh, Knops, and it is uh, divided into grade three A or and grade three B. So 
here you can see uh, the invasion of the uh, or the um, sorry there are three here we can see extension it is uh, it means medial wall is pass, uh, passed through the existing defect or nature pathway and the second the type of extension it is characteristic by uh, medial wall is this displaced and or compressed and the both for these uh, two types it is called non-invasive but for the invasive one it is a true invasive uh, with medial wall that is invaded with the uh, uh, cranial uh, sinus structure so for the uh, clinical uh, features of giant pituitary adenoma typically reflect the preponderance of mass related symptoms more than endocrinological features pituitary uh, adenoma however can also be present for many years without causing any symptoms and be discovered only at autopsy endocrinological are more most among women while symptoms related to mass effect are most common among men for pituitary imaging it is important in confirming the diagnosis of pituitary macroadenoma and also for uh, determining the differential uh, diagnosis of other cellular lesions so pituitary tumors can expand in any direction they can extend superiorly into the uh, hypothalamus diaphragm cella and chiasm laterally into the middle fossa and cavernous sinus Posteriorly, it can invade or passes to the posterior fossa and inferiorly into the sphenoid sinus and the clivus. And for the anterior inv invasion, it is, uh, it is uh, going for the ethmoid sinus, uh, which will be invaded in this case. A rare ancestor, the tumor can uh, even extend into the no nasopharyngeal uh, region, causing symptoms related to nasal obstruction epistaxis or recurrent nasal discharge. Recently, a giant uh, pituitary uh, tumor with uh, nasopharyngeal extension and uh, significant intracranial component reaching the third ventricle has been reported. No surgical outcome, however, was avail available because uh, the, we have not, uh, because the patient from uh, a myocardial infarction immediately. Uh, sorry for this uh, passage. So, for the management of uh, this type of tumor, the goals of the uh, of the management was to remove or control tumor masses and control uh, hyper uh, secretion, correct endocrine deficiencies, while minimizing the risk of hypopituitarism or injury to adjacent structure. So what kind of management option we can describe for this type of tumor? First, we have the observation. It is uh, a kind of management for some cases of uh, large and uh, giant uh, microadenoma. We have the uh, medical uh, therapy options and we have surgery and the radiotherapy, uh, which were well described by uh, our friends from Algeria. So uh, observation, uh, it can be uh, uh, indicated in asymptomatic patients with large or non-secreting adenoma, asymptomatic pro uh, pro uh, prolactinoma. Uh, in this case, imaging must be performed at least yearly for the duration of the patient's life. So when we uh, will intervene, we can uh, indicate surgery for tumor growth on imaging or with symptoms of hyper uh, uh, secretion, development of uh, visual file deficits or comorbidities uh, uh, associated with alteration in hormonal levels, including hypertension, osteopenia, 
diabetes, electrolyte imbalance, uh, or this, uh, dyslipidemia. So surgery remains the primary treatment uh, of non-functional uh, pituitary macroadenoma. It is the optimal management of non-functioning pituitary adenoma sometimes requires two or more approach to obtain a maximal removal. Transfinoidal approach is the safe and effective procedure even in large or giant pituitary adenoma because it allows a rapid and appropriate decompression of the optic nerves and carriers with low morbidity rates. Transcranial approach were indicated only in uh, regular shaped adenoma or it is that could not uh, be reached through the uh, transfinoidal route. So, for the uh, transfinoidal surgery, uh, an uh, operation room, the setting up uh, for transfinoidal surgery with supine uh, uh, position, uh, which was uh, used with the uh, neck hypertension of 15 to uh, 20 degree, as you can see here in this uh, image. And the right nostril uh, septum uh, transfinoidal approach was uh, chosen, like here, you can see here. Uh, so the right uh, nostril septum uh, transfinoidal approach was chosen uh, to scrap as much uh, as more as, as much tumor tissue as possible until the diaphragm cella. You can see here uh, until the uh, diaphragm cella uh, satisfied the uh, shin here. You can see here uh, the debulking procedure for the tumor. Uh, for example, when we have uh, CSF leak from exam for this. Uh, part of the dura, dura or uh, uh, diaphragm uh, cella here, we can uh, proceed to uh, put, uh, for example, the craniocerebral glue, which, use, uh, which was used to uh, seal off cerebrospinal fluid uh, leakage from uh, this part. For transcranial uh, approach, were indicated only in uh, irregular shaped adenoma or eccentric uh, extensions that uh, could not be reached through the transcranial road. The perineal surgery generally uh, chose the right uh, approach. For the left approach, which was uh, chosen when the tumor was significantly uh, based toward uh, the left side. Various yeah. structures were carefully dissected in, the, in both of uh, this approach. Uh, uh, dissected and tumor within the capsule was gradually removed under the microscope without damaging the surrounding structure. Anterior uh, oh. hemispheric approach or transcortical uh, uh, approach could uh, achieve resection of a uh, variety of large tumors located along the median line of the cellular region. By uh, separating the median lines uh, structure of the frontal part exposed in the cellular region in anterohemispheric pressure manner. So uh, for the uh, reoperation, re it, uh, it may be uh, an option in case of tumor regrowth or recurrence. Results uh, obtained after uh, second uh, operation are generally inferior to, to those obtained after the first operation. Indeed, uh, a remnant persistent in 72% uh, of cases or a visual recovery is more readily achieved. Uh, 58% uh, for the first time of surgery versus 19% for the uh, story, uh, 55, 58% uh, for the reoperation time versus 90% recovery uh, for the first time. Moreover, there is a, a higher risk of complication with uh, an increased rate of diabetes and cerebrospinal uh, cerebrospinal fluid uh, leaks, which is four uh, percent.
دكتور فهد I don't know what is the problem You will check, you will check, please Je pense que docteur Sofiane euh, Sofiane Wally aura eu problème de connexion. If you permit, uh, we have we are very late because uh, usually this webinar is for two hours, and if we can conclude, uh, docteur Sofiane, please, because we have uh, it's a very very uh, interesting uh, uh, topic and we need to have a discussion uh, uh, among our participants uh, and uh, to uh, ask uh, the speakers uh, especially professor Salman professor Mahmoud uh, about uh, this uh, really challenging uh, topic and we had we have with us uh, some uh, masters in this topic and we need uh, Their, uh, their opinions before, uh, uh, of course, uh, ending this uh, webinar. Please. Uh. Okay, okay. Uh, the, for the uh, radiotherapy uh, options, uh, it is well described by uh, my friend from Algeria. And uh, for, for the post-therapy uh, uh, post evaluation, it is based on contrast uh, enhanced MRI. Sofian, yes. your screen, we can see, we can see your screen. Ah, oh, sorry. I'm uh, sorry. Can you uh, do uh, rapidly? Okay. 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 Do you see it? We are going to finish with uh, some cases uh, quickly. Uh, the first case, which was uh, admitted in our department for uh, recently, it is a 24-year-old male presented with a progressive vision loss without headache or neurological uh, symptoms. For the history of uh, present illness, the symptoms started only one month prior to uh, presentation and have been uh, progressing gradually. Uh, there is no past medical history and the uh, family history was uh, unremarkable. Uh, with uh, the physical examination noted the uh, profound vision equi uh, equity loss in both eyes and uh, bitemporal uh, imianopia. Laboratory uh, examination which were uh, noted low cortisol levels and mild uh, hyperprolactinemia. Uh, Imaging uh, examination uh, here, we can see uh, the enlargement of the uh, first axilla with the giant masses here, which is extended to the ventricle, uh, the third ventricle and the, the right uh, lateral ventricle. And uh, you can see the contrast uh, enhancement of the tumor. In this uh, ca case, uh, this case was uh, approached through transport. The first time, what is uh, we tried to approach uh, the case with uh, trans uh, sphenoidal approach. The tumor was uh, very uh, hemorrhagic with uh, 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 kind of uh, tissue which is was firm. It is not, uh, which was not uh, habitual to observe this kind of uh, tissue in the uh, cranial uh, or pituitary adenoma. So, so the first time we, uh, we decided to uh, stop the surgery and to uh, convert uh, in the second time with the transcortical, transventricular approach, which you can see here. And the tumor, which is uh, in the first time uh, uh, hemorrhagic in the second uh, surgery, we, uh, we didn't uh, note uh, or observe this uh, characteristic uh, through the, the, the second approach. So we, uh, we made the total uh, rejection of the tumor, uh, as you see here in the MRI of control. And uh, the histopathological uh, exam uh, concluded to uh, uh, teriotroph uh, adeno uh, adenoma. 
for the second case, uh, quickly, uh, it is a 41-year-old uh, woman presented with a progressive vision, uh, vision loss with headaches. The symptoms started only one month prior to presentation and have been progressing gradually. Uh, history of past illness, uh, there is no uh, past medical history uh, and uh, the physical examination uh, observed uh, a profound vision uh, acuity loss in both eyes and bay temporal anopia. So uh, in the laboratory examination, there is low uh, cortisol uh, level and TSH uh, levels in the, uh, with mild uh, hyperprolactinemia. So the imaging uh, which done uh, for the patient showed this uh, macro uh, adenoma with uh, superior extension and invasion of both of uh, uh, cavernous sinuses. We try to remove uh, the most important part of the, the lesion through a transsphenoidal uh, approach. So uh, it is a classic uh, macroadenoma in the surgical uh, exam. You can see here the postoperative uh, immediately uh, MRI, which, uh, which uh, shows here a, a large part of uh, uh, the of the tumor in the cavernous science and the superior part of the uh, tumor. So we decided to uh, to make radiotherapy for the patient, and this is the first MRI uh, after the uh, radiation. You can say, you see here the persistence of the mass tumor, as we can see it for the first time uh, post-operative uh, uh, MRI. For the uh, third case, it is a sixth-four-year-old. Please hurry up, uh, Sofian. Yes, okay. This is the, I, I want to finish with this case. Uh, presented in February uh, 2018 with severe headaches and diplopia. The symptoms started several months prior to presentation and have been progressing gradually. There is no past medical history for the patient, and uh, the physical examination was unremarkable. So, uh, with normal uh, level of uh, laboratory uh, exams. So the imaging uh, uh, MRI showed this mass which developed uh, inside of the uh, cella here and with a small extension to the uh, superior part here, you can see it. For the first time, uh, we concluded uh, for uh, a macroadenoma uh, graded uh, two when uh, we did the, the surgery it, uh, through the transphenoidal approach, we observed uh, a soft tissue uh, which is uh, firm and uh, very hemorrhagic. So we did uh, a small biopsy and the histological exam uh, concluded uh, to uh, pituitary spancel oncocytoma. So uh, as you can uh, see here, in some cases, for the first case and the, this case, we uh, observed uh, another kind of consistency uh, for the uh, tumor tissue, which is firm, and that uh, in this consistency it is related uh, to the level of uh, conjunctive tissue inside of the tumor, which is uh, showed low uh, level in uh, normal uh, tumor tissue or normal macroadenoma. But when we have uh, a high level of conjunctive, uh, we can uh, see uh, another consistency of the tumor, which is observed in uh, 5 to 13 percent of cases described in the literature. And uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Sofian uh, Bali, for, for this uh, intervention. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think that uh, all of you want to hear uh, one of the oldest neurosurgeon and uh, the point of view and uh, the opinion of uh, our oldest, Professor Khamlishi. Professor Khamlishi, did you hear me?
Professor Hamlishi. Yeah, I am here. Hello? Yes, Professor Hamlishi. Yeah, Sufian, can you unshare your screens, please? Need... You're welcome, Mr. You're welcome, Mr. Hamlishi. Yeah, thank you. Thank we you. Want, we, we want to hear you about your large experience. Yes, but, uh, but uh, I, I don't have the audio now. Oh, oh yeah. Uh, uh, please Mr. give Hamlishi? me the audio. Uh, uh, we, we, we hear you. We are hear you, please, uh, Professor Hamlishi. Ah, you hear me? Yeah. Yes, okay. of course. So, You're welcome. So, also, so thank you, thank you for allowing me to speak on this uh, on this nice webinar. Uh, just just to make some comments, not conference. So first, good afternoon to to everybody participating in this in this webinar. And mainly, I see a lot of colleagues and friends. Uh, maybe it's good evening from colleagues from Pakistan or good. Uh, uh, second, thank you very much for the speakers uh, for their outstanding uh, uh, lectures, very nice lectures uh, regarding the discussion uh, between uh, uh, the, 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 the transfinoidal, transcranial, and endoscopic approach of pituitary adenoma, mainly giant pituitary adenoma, and of course, uh, 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 radiosurgery, which represent the main uh, adjuvant treatment today. Uh, just uh, uh, some comments I said. First, uh, I think regarding the, 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 the frequency of the transcranial approach uh, or transcranial approach, uh, uh, it was mentioned that transfinoidal approach represent more than 90 to 95 percent of the approaches. It's maybe uh, uh, true just uh, uh, as, as a first approach, but the, uh, the, the, the endocranial approach is needed in many, many cases, mainly in our area, in our places where we see a quite a large number of large and giant pituitary adenoma as it was, uh, it was shown. Secondly, uh, we had a very interesting, of course, guidelines regarding the use of one or other approach uh, taking in consideration the, 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 the morphology and the, and the size and the orientation of the tumor. But I think there are two other important aspects which should be considered. The first one is the consistency of the tumor. You know, about uh, 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 almost one third, between 20 and 30 percent of, uh, of a large pituitary adenoma are fibrous. So they, uh, the, 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 they, they have a very thick capsula, and this capsula is, is adherent, is not inv invasive to the structures, but it's adherent to the neurostructures. And it can never be removed uh, by transfinoidal approach, where in general we are making an endocapsular approach. So in these cases, it's necessary to uh, uh, make transcranial approach, and it's possible to remove them even if, when they are quite large, more than four or five centimeters. The, the second characteristic is the invasiveness, which is different from the, 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 the fibrous aspect. The invasiveness, many colleagues shown us the MRI and this, uh, and this uh, famous classification of KNOPS uh, 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 on the invasiveness of the, of the, of the sphenoids of the cavernous sinus, but the most important uh, aspect is the in, to, to see the invasiveness during surgery, because this is, is the really a limit of the total excision of the tumors, even if the size is not so important. Very, very, uh, 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 and this invasiveness exists in a less, fortunately, in a less than 10% of uh, uh, pituitary uh, uh, adenomas. And these characteristics is important to be pointed out for uh, two important reasons. As I said, almost never possible to remove all the tumor. So to search about adjuvant treatment, which was insufficient. And secondly, to know the best treatment for this, for this invas invasive uh, uh, adenoma, which recur very quickly, uh, is uh, to, it's important to have a very uh, 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 profound pathological uh, analysis, mainly 
some, uh, some, uh, some pathological uh, uh, markers and mainly some, uh, some studies on the proliferation of the tumor because this will allow you to know this uh, a group, a very small group of uh, between uh, two and five percent of pituitary adenoma who behave as malignant tumors and who needs, of course, very special multidisciplinary uh, uh, team treatment. Just to add uh, something regarding the technical uh, 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 aspect, uh, 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 surgical aspect, uh, I, I don't know if I have well understood the, 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 the slides of all the colleagues, but I, it seems to me that I have seen some colleagues who are approaching, of course, today uh, 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 using the ondonasal approach uh, uh, trans in transphenoidal surgery. We are using this, uh, this approach since more than 20 years, but they dissect the, the mucosa at the beginning of the nose and they dissect completely the symptom. It's absolutely not necessary. And it's one of the aspects which makes our colleagues who are using endoscopy saying that the microsurgery is more uh, invasive. We, we don't know, need to dissect the mucosa uh, 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 along the septum. We have just to go to the, to the, to the bone uh, part uh, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the septum and then as the colleagues using the endoscopy to, 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 to uh, open the, 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 the septum and then uh, to coagulate the mucosa to, to, to open the septum and directly we, are, uh, 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 we can open then the sphenoid sinus. I think that uh, th this, which makes the microsurgical uh, uh, approach exactly regarding, uh, compared to the, the endoscopy, which endoscopy is, is, is uh, I think, is, is a great uh, 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 progress, uh, and it's, it's, it can be considered in many, in many, uh, in many cases, as, as, as colleagues have shown, as a complement of the microsurgery. And the, and the second uh, thing in, in, uh, in, uh, in, my, in uh, the last remark regarding surgery, please pay attention when you approach by transphenoidal, appro uh, by transphenoidal way, the large pituitary adenoma extending vertically, I said vertically, more than four or five centimeters above the diaphragma cilia. Because when the adenoma is soft, you have a very, uh, a, a, a very quick decompression and you have in some cases, and we lost one or two patients uh, because of that uh, at the beginning of our experience more than 30 years ago, you have a rupture of some hypothalamic small arteries and patients of course get a hemorrhage and uh, you, lose, you lose them in the days following surgery. So pay, atten pay attention. Uh, uh, for me, in this large extension, even if it's on the midline, straight in the midline, the, 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 the transphenoidal approach should be done uh, just to have a small decompression and biopsy, and it should be completed with the, the endocranial uh, uh, approach. So this is, uh, this is uh, 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 and I would like to congratulate Adil about his excellent presentation. Uh, 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 the, 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 I think that, uh, and this is maybe to point out, we have seen uh, our colleagues in, uh, in, uh, in Lausanne uh, operating small uh, remanent tumor in the lateral uh, 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 left side uh, 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 or right side of the cavernous sinus, which I think uh, Adil has shown that it, uh, it, it can be really safely treated and efficiently with 100% disappearance of this lesion three or, uh, or, or six months later. That's all, so thank you very much for, uh, for your patience and for giving me the opportunity to, to speak on this, uh, on this, on one of my favorite topics. As many colleagues, they know that we introduced transphenoidal surgery in Rabat in 1979. I operated the first case and now we have of course more than 1,000 or 2,000 cases operated. Thank you very much.